response from business and government to climate change is clearly inadequate. We've known about this issue for more than five decades. If we look at the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, we've now passed 400 parts per million. That exceeds the pre-industrial level of 280 parts per million. The last time we were at this level was some several millions of years ago before humans had actually evolved. And sea levels were at least 20 metres higher than they currently are. The development of human-induced climate disruption is integrally related to the evolution of global capitalism. Over the last 200 years of industrial development, uh, human civilization is largely addicted to fossil fuel-based energy, coal, oil and gas. Added to that, we have seen the diminution of uh, natural resources such as forests and oceans which act as carbon sinks. And then on top of that, more recently, last 40 or so years, we've had the globalization of economic activity and the expansion of consumption under global capitalism. So the first political myth we identify is the idea of corporate environmentalism, which argues essentially that corporations can win by making money, but at the same time the environment can also benefit. So corporations are seen as the best stewards of environmental improvement, and we criticise that particular argument. The second political myth we focus on is the idea of corporate citizenship, which is the argument that essentially corporations are the key actors in the political debates of our time, such as climate change. So they should be engaged in shaping legislation to try and solve climate change. The third political myth is the idea of corporate omnipotence, essentially arguing there is no alternative to market fundamentalism and corporations as the key agents of social change. So we see four emerging trends in response to the climate crisis. The first is essentially the idea of government intervening through regulation to limit um, our escalating fossil fuel emissions. And a good example was President Obama passing legislation to limit emissions from coal-fired power stations. The second trend we're seeing is the idea of renewable reinvention, which is uh, where we're seeing technological innovations like Tesla's Powerwall, um, radically reducing the cost of solar and wind power and people being able to generate their own energy and store it at home. The third trend we're seeing uh, in relation to the climate crisis is essentially a reconsideration of the whole concept of economic growth and thinking about the idea of a steady state economy. And then finally, and most optimistically, I guess, is the grassroots social mobilisation within civil society towards the climate crisis, that people are now starting to take power into their own hands, a sort of grassroots democracy response to the climate crisis around divestment. We need to completely reframe the way we understand ourselves and our relationship to nature if we're to meaningfully respond to the climate crisis. And that involves a number of things. Firstly, we need a new language and a new way of thinking about our relationship to nature, that we are part of nature, not separate from it. That we need to challenge the economic framing of this problem, that it's not just about dollars value, but it's about broader values. And finally, that we need to reconsider at a, at a very individual level our identities and our emotional engagement with this crisis. This issue really does change everything about the way in which we interact with the natural world.